Frauds on the Fairies, from the Household Words, Volume 8, Number 184, by Charles Dickens. We may assume that we are not singular in entertaining a very great tenderness for the fairy literature of our childhood. What enchanted us then, and is captivating a million of young fancies now, has at the same blessed time of life enchanted vast hosts of men and women who have done their long day's work and laid their grey heads down to rest. It would be hard to estimate the amount of gentleness and mercy that has made its way among us through these slight channels. Forbearance, courtesy, consideration for the poor and aged, kind treatment of animals, the love of nature, abhorrence of tyranny and brute force. Many such good things have been first nourished in the child's heart by this powerful aid. It has greatly helped to keep us, in some sense, ever young by preserving through our worldly ways one slender track, not overgrown with weeds, where we may walk with children, sharing their delights. In an utilitarian age, of all other times, it is a matter of grave importance that fairy tales should be respected. Our English red tape is too magnificently red ever to be employed in the tying up of such trifles. But everyone who has considered the subject knows full well that a nation without fancy, without some romance, never did, never can, never will hold a great place under the sun. The theatre, having done its worst to destroy these admirable fictions, and having in a most exemplary manner destroyed itself, its artists and its audiences, in that perversion of its duty, it becomes doubly important that the little books themselves, nurseries of fancy as they are, should be preserved. To preserve them in their usefulness, they must be as much preserved in their simplicity and purity and innocent extravagance as if they were actual fact. Whosoever alters them to suit his own opinions, whatever they are, is guilty to our thinking of an act of presumption and appropriates to himself what does not belong to him. We have lately observed with pain the intrusion of a whole hog of unwieldy dimensions into the fairy flower garden. The rooting of the animal among the roses would in itself have awakened in us nothing but indignation. Our pains arise from his being violently driven in by a man of genius, our own beloved friend, Mr. George Cruikshank. That incomparable artist is, of all men, the last who should lay his exquisite hand on fairy text. In his own art he understands it so perfectly, and illustrates it so beautifully, so humorously, so wisely, that he should never lay down his etching needle to edit the ogre, to whom with that little instrument he can render such extraordinary justice. But to editing ogres and hopper my thumbs and their families, our dear moralist has in a rash moment taken as a means of propagating the doctrines of total abstinence, prohibition of the sale of spiritous liquors, free trade and popular education. For the introduction of these topics, he has altered the text of a fairy story, and against his right to do any such thing, we protest with all our might and main. Of his likewise altering it to advertise that excellent series of plates, the bottle, we say nothing more than that we foresee a new and improved edition of Goody Two Shoes, edited by E. Moses and Son, of the Dervish with the Box of Ointment, edited by Professor Holloway, and of Jack and the Beanstalk, edited by Mary Wedlake, the popular authoress of do you bruise your oats yet? Now it makes not the least difference to our objection whether we agree or disagree with our worthy friend Mr. Cruikshank in the opinions he interpolates upon an old fairy story. Whether good or bad in themselves, they are, in that relation, like the famous definition of a weed, 
a thing growing up in a wrong place. He has no greater moral justification in altering the harmless little books than we should have in altering his best etchings. If such a precedent were followed, we must soon become disgusted with the old stories into which modern personages so obtruded themselves, and the stories themselves must soon be lost. With seven blue beards in the field, each coming at a gallop from his own platform mounted on a foaming hobby, a generation or two hence would not know which was which, and the great original Bluebeard would be confounded with the counterfeits. Imagine a total abstinence edition of Robinson Crusoe, with the rum left out. Imagine a peace edition, with the gunpowder left out and the rum left in. Imagine a vegetarian edition, with the goat's flesh left out. Imagine a Kentucky edition, to introduce a flogging of that tarnal old nigger Friday, twice a week. Imagine an Aborigines Protection Society edition, to deny the cannibalism, and make Robinson embrace the amiable savages whenever they landed. Robinson Crusoe would be edited out of his island in a hundred years, and the island would be swallowed up in the editorial ocean. Among the other learned professions, we have now the platform profession, chiefly exercised by a new and meritorious class of commercial travellers who go about to take the sense of meetings on various articles, some of a very superior description, some not quite so good. Let us write the story of Cinderella, edited by one of these gentlemen, doing a good stroke of business and having a rather extensive mission. Once upon a time, a rich man and his wife were the parents of a lovely daughter. She was a beautiful child and became, at her own desire, a member of the Juvenile Bands of Hope when she was only four years of age. When this child was only nine years of age, her mother died, and all the Juvenile Bands of Hope in her district, the Central District number 527, formed in a procession of two and two amounting to fifteen hundred, and followed her to the grave, singing chorus number 42, O Come, etc. This grave was outside the town and under the direction of the local board of health, which reported at certain stated intervals to the general board of health, Whitehall. The motherless little girl was very sorrowful for the loss of her mother, and so was her father too, at first. But after a year was over, he married again, a very cross widow lady, with two proud, tyrannical daughters, as cross as herself. He was aware that he could have made his marriage with this lady a civil process by simply making a declaration before a registrar, but he was averse to this course on religious grounds, and, being a member of the Mongolfian persuasion, was married according to the ceremonies of that respectable church by the Reverend Jared Jocks, who improved the occasion. He did not live long with his disagreeable wife, having been shamefully accustomed to shave with warm water instead of cold, which he ought to have used, see medical appendix B and C, his undermined constitution could not bear up against her temper, and he soon died. Then this orphan was cruelly treated by her stepmother and the two daughters, and was forced to do the dirtiest of the kitchen work, to scour the saucepans, wash the dishes, and light the fires, which did not consume their own smoke, but emitted a dark vapour prejudicial to the bronchial tubes. The only warm place in the house where she was free from ill-treatment was the kitchen chimney corner, and as she used to sit down there among the cinders when her work was done, the proud fine sisters gave her the name of Cinderella. About this time, the king of the land, who never made war against anybody, and allowed everybody to make war against him, which was the reason why his subjects were the greatest manufacturers on earth, and always lived in security and peace, gave a great feast, which was to last two days. This splendid banquet was to consist entirely of artichokes and gruel, and from among those who were invited to it, and to hear the delightful speeches after dinner, 
the king's son was to choose a bride for himself. The proud fine sisters were invited, but nobody knew anything about poor Cinderella, and she was to stay at home. She was so sweet-tempered, however, that she assisted the haughty creatures to dress, and bestowed her admirable taste upon them as freely as if they had been kind to her. Neither did she laugh when they broke seventeen stay-laces in dressing, for although she wore no stays herself, being sufficiently acquainted with the anatomy of the human figure to be aware of the destructive effects of tight lacing, she always reserved her opinion on that subject for the regenerative record, price three halfpence in a neat wrapper, which all good people take in, and to which she was a contributor. At length the wished-for moment arrived, and the proud fine sisters swept away to the feast and speeches, leaving Cinderella in the chimney corner. But she could always occupy her mind with the general question of the ocean penny postage, and she had in her pocket an unread oration on that subject, made by the well-known orator Nehemiah Nix. She was lost in the fervid eloquence of the talented apostle, when she became aware of the presence of one of those female relatives which, it may not be generally known, it is not lawful for a man to marry. I allude to her grandmother. Why so solitary, my child? said the old lady to Cinderella. Alas, grandmother, returned the poor girl, my sisters have gone to the feast and speeches, and here sit I in the ashes, Cinderella. Never! cried the old lady, with animation, shall one of the band of hope despair. Run into the garden, my dear, and fetch me an American pumpkin. American, because in some parts of that independent country there are prohibitory laws against the sale of alcoholic drink in any form. Also, because America produced, among many great pumpkins, the glory of her sex, Mrs. Colonel Bloomer, None but an American pumpkin will do, my child. Cinderella ran into the garden and brought the largest American pumpkin she could find. This virtuously democratic vegetable her grandmother immediately changed into a splendid coach. Then she sent her for six mice from the mouse trap, which she changed into prancing horses, free from the obnoxious and oppressive post-horse duty then to the rat trap in the stable for a rat, which she changed to a state coachman, not amenable to the iniquitous assessed taxes, then to look behind a watering pot for six lizards, which she changed into six footmen, each with a petition in his hand, ready to present to the prince, signed by fifty thousand persons, in favour of the early closing movement. But grandmother, said Cinderella, stopping in the midst of her delight, and looking at her clothes, how can I go to the palace in these miserable rags? Be not uneasy about that, my dear, returned her grandmother. Upon which the old lady touched her with her wand, her rags disappeared, and she was beautifully dressed. Not in the present costume of the female sex, which has been proved to be at once grossly immodest and absurdly inconvenient but in rich sky-blue satin pantaloons gathered at the ankle, a puce-coloured satin pelisse sprinkled with silver flowers, and a very broad leghorn hat. The hat was chastely ornamented, with a rainbow-coloured ribbon hanging in two bell-pulls down the back. The pantaloons were ornamented with a golden stripe, and the effect of the whole was unspeakably sensible, feminine, and retiring. Lastly, the old lady put on Cinderella's feet a pair of shoes made of glass. Observing that, but for the abolition of the duty on that article, it never could have been devoted to such a purpose, the effect of all such taxes being to cramp invention and embarrass the producer to the manifest injury of the consumer. When the old lady had made these wise remarks, she dismissed Cinderella to the feast and speeches charging her by no means to remain after twelve o'clock at night. The arrival of Cinderella at the monster gathering produced a great excitement, as a delegate from the United States had just moved that the king do take the chair, and as the motion had been seconded and carried unanimously, 
the king himself could not go forth to receive her, but his royal highness the prince, who was to move the second resolution, went to the door to hand her from her carriage. This virtuous prince, being completely covered from head to foot with total abstinence medals, shone as if he were attired in complete armour, while the inspiring strains of the peace brass band in the gallery, composed of the Lambkin family, eighteen in number, who cannot be too much encouraged, awakened additional enthusiasm. The king's son handed Cinderella to one of the reserved seats for pink tickets on the platform, and fell in love with her immediately. His appetite deserted him. He scarcely tasted his artichokes and merely trifled with his gruel. When the speeches began, and Cinderella, wrapped in the eloquence of the two inspired delegates who occupied the entire evening in speaking to the first resolution, occasionally cried, Hear, hear, the sweetness of her voice completed her conquest of the prince's heart. But indeed the whole male portion of the assembly loved her, and doubtless would have done so, even if she had been less beautiful, in consequence of the contrast which her dress presented to the bold and ridiculous garments of the other ladies. At a quarter before twelve, the second inspired delegate, having drunk all the water in the decanter and fainted away, the king put the question, that this meeting do now adjourn until tomorrow. Those who were of that opinion holding up their hands, and then those who were of the contrary, theirs, there appeared an immense majority in favour of the resolution, which was consequently carried. Cinderella got home in safety, and heard nothing all that night or all next day but the praises of the unknown lady with the sky-blue satin pantaloons. When the time for the feast and speeches came around again, the cross stepmother and the proud fine daughters went out in good time to secure their places. As soon as they were gone, Cinderella's grandmother returned and changed her as before. Amid a blast of welcome from the Lambkin family, she was again handed to the pink seat on the platform by His Royal Highness. This gifted prince was a powerful speaker and had the evening before him. He rose at precisely ten minutes before eight, and was greeted with tumultuous cheers and waving of handkerchiefs. When the excitement had in some degree subsided, he proceeded to address the meeting, who were never tired of listening to speeches, as no good people ever are. He held them enthralled for four hours and a quarter. Cinderella forgot the time, and hurried away so when she heard the first stroke of twelve, that her beautiful dress changed back to her old rags at the door, and she left one of her glass shoes behind. The prince took it up and vowed, that is, made a declaration before a magistrate, for he objected on principle to the multiplying of oaths, that he would only marry the charming creature to whom that shoe belonged. He accordingly caused an advertisement to that effect to be inserted in all the newspapers, for the advertisement duty an impost most unjust in principle, and most unfair in operation, did not exist in that country, neither was the stamp on newspapers known in that land, which had as many newspapers as the United States, and got as much good out of them. Innumerable ladies answered the advertisement, and pretended that the shoe was theirs, but every one of them was unable to get her foot into it. The proud fine sisters answered it, and tried their feet with no greater success. Then Cinderella, who had answered it too, came forward amidst their scornful jeers, and the shoe slipped on in a moment. It is a remarkable tribute to the improved and sensible fashion of the dress her grandmother had given her, that if she had not worn it, the prince would probably never have seen her feet. The marriage was solemnized with great rejoicing. When the honeymoon was over, the king retired from public life and was succeeded by the prince. Cinderella, being now a queen, applied herself to the government of the country on enlightened, liberal and free principles. All the people who ate anything she did not eat, or who drank anything she did not drink, 
were imprisoned for life. All the newspaper offices from which any doctrine proceeded that was not her doctrine were burnt down. All the public speakers proved to demonstration that if there were any individual on the face of the earth who differed from them in anything, that individual was a designing ruffian and an abandoned monster. She also threw open the right of voting and of being elected to public office and of making the laws to the whole of her sex, who thus came to be always gloriously occupied with public life and whom nobody dared to love and they all lived happily ever afterwards. Frauds on the fairies once permitted, we see little reason why they may not come to this, and great reason why they may. The vicar of Wakefield was wisest when he was tired of being always wise. The world is too much with us early and late. Leave this precious old escape from it alone. End of Frauds on the Fairies from Household Words, Volume 8, Number 184. Recording by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland.